Philosophers and geometricians have divided the land of Hind into nine unequal parts, giving to each a separate name. Its shape resembles the back of a crab on the surface of the water. The mountains and the plains in these nine parts of India are extensive and occur one after the other in successive order. The mountains appear to stand near each other like the joints of the spine and extend through the inhabited world from the east to the midst of the west. Rivers flow at their base, one which comes from the south of India is very large and broad but in other places they have their sources in the north, in the lofty mountains and in the deserts. Hind is surrounded on the east by China and Tibet, on the west by Iran and Kabul and on the south by the sea. The river of the country of Hind which flow from northern mountains amount to 11. Those which flow from the eastern mountains amount to the same number. These run far to the east and to the south till they fall into the ocean. Those however which rise in the south do not discharge themselves into the sea. The northern mountains have connections with Mount Meru which lies south of them. Besides this, there is another lofty ridge of mountains intervening between Turkestan, Tibet and Hind. Tibet and China appear red. The descent from its summit to Tibet is one prasang. This mountain is so high that Firdausi probably meant the following verse to apply to it. It is so low and so high, so soft and so hard that you may see its belly from the fish on which the earth rests, its back from the moon. The inhabitants of Kashmir suffer greatly from their encroachments and depredations. The mountains here mentioned are those described in the translation of Abu Rihan and they are as manifest as a tortoise displaying from the midst of the waters. The Hindus believe that the Ganga has its source in paradise and descending to the earth is divided into seven streams, the center one being denominated the Ganga. The nation of Hind can be divided into three climates. The western portion is in the third, the eastern in the first, but the chief portion of Hind is included in the second climate. Its central territory is called Madhyadesh, which means the middle land. The Persians call it Kanaj. It is called the Madhyadesh because it lies between the seas and the mountains, between the hot and the cold countries, and between the two extremities of west and east. It was the capital of the great haughty and proud despots of India. Sindh lies on the west of this territory. If anyone wishes to come from Nimroz, meaning the country of Sijistan or Iran to this region, he will have to pass through Kabul. The city of Kanauj stands on the western bank of the Ganga. It was formerly a most magnificent city, but in consequence of its being deserted by its ruler, it has now fallen into neglect and ruin, and Bari, which is three days journey from it on the eastern side of the Ganga, is now the capital. Kanauj is celebrated for the descendants of the Pandavs, as Mathura is on account of Vasudev. The river Jamuna lies in the east of the city and there is a distance of 27 prasangs between the two rivers. The city of Thanesar is situated between the rivers, nearly 70 prasangs north of Kanauj and 50 prasangs from Mathura. The Ganga issues from its source called Gangadwar and waters many of the cities of India. In going from Mathura to Ujjain, you pass through several neighboring villages at no greater distance from one another than five prasangs. Kashmir is a valley surrounded by lofty inaccessible hills and broad deserts. From the mountain of Bhutasar to Kashmir, across the country of Tibet is nearly 300 prasangs. The people of Kashmir do not ride on quadrupeds but are carried on men's shoulders in a katut, which resembles a throne. The servants of the government are always on the alert and watch the passes and strongholds of the country. The Sindh rises in the mountains of Amak, on the borders of the Turkish country. 
passing by the mountains of Belur and Shamalan. It rises in the east in two days' journey to the country of the Bhutavari Turks, from whose encroachments and depredations the Kashmirians suffer great distress. Whoever travels along the left bank of the river will find villages and towns which are close to one another on the south of the capital. Before entering on our exposition, we must form an adequate idea of that which renders it so perfectly difficult to penetrate to the essential nature of any Indian subject. The subject of these difficulties will either facilitate the work of our progress or serve as an apology for any shortcomings of ours. For the readers must always bear in the mind that the Hindus entirely differ from us Muslims in every respect, many a subject appearing intricate and obscure which would be perfectly clear if there were more connections between us. The barriers which separate Muslims and Hindus rest on different causes. First, they differ from us in everything which other nations might have in common. And here we first mention the language, although the differences of languages also exist between other nations. But in India, if you want to conquer this difficulty, you have to learn Sanskrit. Because the language is of an enormous range both in words and inflections, something like the Arabic, calling one and the same thing by various names, both original and derived, and using one and the same word for a variety of subjects, which in order to be properly understood, must be distinguished from each other by various qualifying epithet. Secondly, they totally differ from us in religion, as we believe in nothing in which they believe. On the whole, there is very little disputing about theological topics among themselves. At utmost they fight with words, but they will never stake their soul or body or their property on religious controversy. On the contrary, all their fanaticism is directed against those who don't belong to them, against all foreigners. They call the foreigners mlecha, meaning impure, and they forbid having any connection with the mlechas, be it a relation eating together, drinking, or even sharing the same air at times. They think by doing any of these, they will be polluted. They consider as impure anything which touches the fire and the water of a foreigner, and no household can exist without these two elements. Besides, they never desire that a thing which once has been polluted should be purified and thus recovered, as under ordinary circumstances if anybody or anything has become unclean, he or it would strive to regain the state of purity. In the third place, in all manners and usages, they differ from us to such a degree as to frighten their children with us, with our dress and our ways and customs, and as to declare us to be the devil's breed, and our doings as the very opposite of all that is good and proper. By the by, we must confess, in the order to be just, that a similar depreciation of foreigners not only prevails among us and the Hindus, but is common to all nations towards each other. Another circumstance which increased the already existing antagonism between Hindus and the foreigners is the Shamania Buddhists, who sent their missionaries out of way to convert people to their faith. Though the Buddhist faith is very similar to the Hindu faith, yet the Brahmins and the Buddhists differ in many aspects. In former times, Khorasan, Persia, Iraq, Mosul, the country up to the frontier of Syria was heavily influenced by Hindu and Buddhistic religion. But then Zarathustra went forth from Azerbaijan and preached a new faith, which is known as Zoroastrianism by many. Zoroastrianism dominated Persia, Iraq, Mosul, Baghdad up to the Arabian land for over a thousand year period. But then came Islam, the Persian Empire perished and the repugnance of the Hindus against foreigners increased more and more when the Muslims began to make their inroads into their country. Things really did go wrong after Muhammad bin Qasim attacked Sindh and conquered it. When Muhammad bin Qasim conquered Multan, he inquired how the town had become so very flourishing and so many treasures had there been accumulated. And then he found out that this idol of a goddess was the cause. 
for there came pilgrims from all sides of Hind. Therefore, he thought it would be best to have the idol where it is, but he hung a piece of cow's flesh on its neck by way of mockery. On the same place, a mosque was built. When the Karmashians occupied Multan, Jalam ibn Shaiban, the usurper, broke the idol into pieces and killed its priest. The treatment met by the Hindus from Al Qasim was not seen as a welcoming sign by the rest of the nation. All these events planted a deeply rooted hatred in their hearts against us Muslims. Now, in the following times, no Muslim conqueror passed beyond the frontier of Kabul and the river Sindh until the days of the Turks when they seized the power in Ghazna under Shamani dynasty. The supreme power fell to the lot of Nasir ad daula Sabuktajin. This prince chose holy war or jihad as his calling and therefore called himself Al-Ghazi. In the interest of his successors, he constructed in order to weaken the Indian frontier, those roads on which afterwards his son Yamin Attala Mahmud marched into India during a 30-year period. God be merciful to both son and father. Mahmud utterly ruined the prosperity of India and performed there wonderful exploits by which Hindus became like atoms of dust scattered in all directions and like a tale of old in the mouth of the people. Their scattered remains cherish, of course, the most inveterate aversions towards all Muslims. This is the reason to which Hindu sciences have retired far away from those parts of the country conquered by us and have fled to places which our hands cannot yet reach to Kashmir, Banaras, and there the antagonism between them and all the foreigners receives more and more nourishment, both from political and religious sources. In the older times, the Hindu faith travelled across nations and reached all the way up to Greek and Romania, resulting in the heathen Greeks before the rise of Christianity holding same opinions and beliefs much as the Hindus, their educated classes thought much as same as those of the Hindus, their common people held the same idolatrous views as those of the Hindus. <laughs>